welcome everyone. We're so excited to see so many people who share our excitement and interest in applying arts-based methods in DBT with youth. Um, arts invokes wonderful emotions in all of us and DBT is such a powerful intervention. So bringing these two aspects creates so many possibilities to enhance youth in their well-being. So our goal today then is to explore DBT and four core facets of this intervention, including metaphor use, mindfulness skills, distress tolerance techniques, and dialectics. And also to look at ways of applying creative arts activities within each of these core facets. So this is how we're gonna be planning to spend our time together. We're gonna to talk a bit about ourselves and our background so you know exactly who we are. We'll provide an overview of DBT basics, including the core tenets of DBT and how the intervention works to address emotion dysregulation disorders. And then we'll explore various ways that art intersects with DBT skills, looking specifically at those core facets I mentioned earlier. So mindfulness skills, distress tolerance skills to support youth that might be in a state of crisis. We'll look at the use of metaphors in DBT and how you can use metaphors as a creative tool to help youth develop dialectical skills. Um, so we have a very full program packed. And I'm so happy to be presenting today with my colleague, Dr. Carmen Lalonde, who is one of my favorite humans. Mm -hmm. um, she's a registered psychologist um, in New York and also here in Ontario. Carmen currently trains clinicians and is a supervisor and program leader for psychological assessment at Broadview Psychology. In addition to being intensely trained in standard DBT for adults, she's also trained in various other adaptations of DBT. And aside from her clinical qualifications, Carmen is also deeply committed to advocacy and providing affirming care to the LGBTQ community. So I'll let Carmen say hi. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adana. Um, it's a pleasure for us to be here and to be presenting with my close friend and colleague and excellent clinician, Adana. She is a registered social worker with a Master of Social Work from the University of Toronto. She has worked in a variety of settings and her therapeutic practice is grounded in trauma-informed and strength-based approaches with an emphasis on the mind, body, and environment connection. And she is particularly committed to equitable care, access to mental health services, and kind of reducing the gap between access to care for marginalized youth. And besides her commitment to efficacy, she's also extensively trained in DBT and the variations of it, as well as narrative therapy. So a little bit about us, just very briefly, Broadview Psychology is a private practice. It's a group-based practice in Toronto. It was actually one of the first um, um, clinics to create an inherent um, high-fidelity comprehensive DBT program. It is one of the areas that we specialize in, in terms of providing adherent DBT across the lifespan. And in addition to that, we also offer individual and group therapy in a number of other modalities. And a unique element of Broadview psychology is that we are a very family-focused clinic and that we really aim to include the entire system, the entire family in the care because we understand that creating change within the environment is pivotal to sustaining change within the clients that we work with. And Broadview Psychology Clinic is also committed to working collaboratively with community as well as increasing access to services for equity seeking groups. As part of our efforts to increase access to services, we hold monthly psychoeducation workshops such as this one. And our workshops are typically free to the public to attend. So that is us in a nutshell. Um, what about you all? We would love to hear what settings folks are coming from, the type of work you're engaged in with youth. So please feel free to use the chat and introduce yourselves. So some of you might already have done previous training in DBT and are somewhat familiar with the basics. For others, maybe DBT is an intervention that you're just beginning to explore. You're just beginning to deep your fit in. So let's go over some of the foundational elements of this therapy. Dialectical behavioral therapy is a clinical intervention initially designed to treat adults diagnosed with BPD and at risk for suicide. 
Now, the standard DBT has been proven to be highly effective in decreasing symptoms related to BPD. And more studies have since been conducted with several other populations, including adolescents and outpatients, residential and detention facilities. And it's important to note that many of these um, studies that were conducted among adolescents uh, were conducted among adolescents exhibiting a broad range of diagnostic presentations. So including self-harm, suicidal ideation and behavior, disordered eating, PTSD, and oppositionality. So the research evidence shows that compared to control groups, DBT for adolescents showed effectiveness for reducing self-harm, suicidal ideation, as well as reduction in depressive symptoms, reduction in manic symptoms, um, in addition to emotion dysregulation, binge and purge episodes. DBT for adolescents have also been found to increase positive behaviors and psychosocial functioning among teens. And there's also really strong evidence too that found that neuro neurobiological changes in patients after the completion of DBT um, were really, really pervasive. So results from these studies indicated significant deactivation of the amygdala activity and other brain regions that are involved in cognitive regulation of emotions. So what is DBT? Well, like I, I mentioned earlier, I was originally created for high risk, multiple diagnosis clients with pervasive severe emotion dysregulation. And the goal of DBT is to help clients build a life worth living. And this phrase is used because many clients that come to DBT are at the end of their rope. They're struggling with thoughts of ended it all. They're feeling fed up. They're feeling demoralized. So DBT is a multidimensional intervention that combines aspects of behavior, exposure, and cognitive therapy, along with mindfulness and acceptance-based interventions. It also integrates dialectical principles, which we'll explore some more. And it also integrates skills training and coaching. And these aspects all are aimed towards helping clients to build their version of a life worth living. Over the past decade or so, there have been a huge surge of published studies examining the applicability of DBT to diverse populations. And there appears to be promising research that points to DBT being applicable and transferable to clients from equity-seeking equity groups. So when we look closer at the foundational concept and skills underpinning DBT, it's actually pretty apparent to understand why it is transferable to a lot of diverse populations. Much of DBT integrates principles from Eastern philosophy, in fact, Marshall Linehan, who is the founder of DBT, developed and repackaged a lot of the skills using her training in contemplative prayer practice, as well as her studies as a Zen master. So there is quite a bit of spiritual aspects of DBT that a lot of individuals from ethno-cultural communities can resonate with, and it makes it highly suitable for cultural adaptation. DBT operates with certain set of basic assumptions that help us as clinicians, as counselors, youth workers, um, organize our behavior towards our clients. And perhaps one of the most pivotal assumptions is this idea that our clients are doing the best they can. They want to improve and they do need to get better, try harder and be more motivated to change. So these assumptions are accepted as true and by agreeing to behave according to these assumptions, it helps the worker to be more mindful of their own responses and judgments about clients. So I mentioned um, earlier that the type of chronic and pervasive emotion dysregulation that we typically see in our clients requires an intervention to be flexible and it also requires an intervention to be based on principles rather than a one size fits all type of approach. And that's what makes DBT a highly effective intervention. So let's take a closer look at the different aspects of DBT, starting first with the, the name of the therapy. 
by definition, the term dialectical denotes something that involves or relates to the contradiction between two conflicting forces. So in DBT, you, you see this sort of um, synthesis of two things that seem opposite, right? So which is the need for clients to accept themselves as they are and the need for them to change problematic behaviors and thinking styles. And the intervention aims to equip clients with skills towards balancing these two extremes, these two ends. Thanks, Adana. And so as Adana has been indicating, like DBT is transdiagnostic, um, transdiagnostic and it is process-based. And so at the heart of DBT is kind of understanding that it includes mindfulness skills, emotion regulation, distress tolerance, interpersonal skills, and dialectical and middle path skills. And they are branched around acceptance-based, which is mindfulness and distress tolerance, and change-based strategies, which is emotion regulation, interpersonal, and the, synth the synthesis of both. And at the heart of this is understanding that it is all about regulating our emotions. So understanding emotion regulation is really key to understanding the heart of DBT. And when we are able to understand that, we're better able to then apply the skills in a very fluid and dynamic way. So emotion regulation is the ability to regulate effectively one's emotional experience. It is encompassing, understanding, experiencing, expressing, and being able to turn up and turn down our emotional experiences. It involves various areas of the brain that typically develop over our life and are and begin to develop in the early relationship between a caregiver and the child within a secure relationship. Being able to model and see oneself in another helps us develop the capacity to regulate. Knowing that, we also then understand that it can be disrupted. Trauma, difficult parenting experiences, abuse, societal trauma, generational trauma, systemic racism and discrimination can all impact one's ability to develop the capacity to regulate emotions. Knowing though that we can also learn and relearn and overlearn ways of regulating oneself gives us a lot of hope. And so it takes about 25 years to develop our kind of emotion regulation capacity, which means there's lots of opportunities, yes, for mistakes, and there's lots of opportunities for corrections. So when we think about our clients and what DBT was designed for, we can branch kind of dysregulation into two broad categories, and we see multiple behaviors come from that. We have underregulation and we have overregulation. Underregulation, uh, these are typically the clients that come to us, and these are the ones that often get pegged and flagged for services right away because the emotions that they're experiencing often are accompanied by impulsive behavior, high risk taking behavior, suicidality, self harm. Um, we see a lack of control in being able to regulate one's emotional reactions, and there's usually intense reactions to external stimuli. Overregulation is just as dysregulated, except it looks quite different. So these youth often slide under the radar because it's very controlled. There's often a lack of emotional expression, and that unfortunately is highly reinforced in our society. Don't show what you're feeling. Be completely calm, which is not healthy. We want to be able to regulate and show our emotions so they're accurate to our inner experience. But the overregulation, this is actually suppressing and hiding. So these are the youth that often don't show that they're suffering, that may be self-harm in secret and engage in behaviors that don't come to our awareness right away. Both types of dysregulation and both are areas that DBT is designed specifically to address. Some of the challenges that we often face as clinicians who work with youth is that adolescence, this time period, is when we're going through a lot of growth. That part of our brain, not only for executive functioning, but emotion regulation, is rapidly developing. This is when teens are often relying on the self and their peers to help themselves regulate. And if they haven't learned how to manage or regulate, even understand their emotion, emotional experiences early on in life, this time period is very challenging for them. And you have the two added elements of my brain is also learning and developing rapidly right now, and I don't have full executive control. So this is where we often see treatment be quite challenging in helping youth learn the skills, kind of exercise the muscles that 
maybe they didn't get a chance to develop earlier on. So understanding this and understanding that DBT was developed specifically for kind of multi-problem, very complex presenting clients, and understanding that multi-problem clients often at the core, the heart of it, is that they have difficulty regulating their emotions and their interpersonal interactions. They have difficulty regulating their thoughts, their behaviors, that a regulation piece, that is the core of what DBT designs to treat. It's not there to treat specific disorders, even though research shows that it's transdiagnostic so effective in treating multiple disorders. It's actually designed to treat regulation and dysregulation of the person. So going just one step deeper, because we're gonna be really thinking creatively on how to reach youth who struggle to regulate their emotions, we wanna really begin to develop a deep empathic understanding of like what it is for our youth to kind of live with on a day-to-day -day basis. So youth who have dysregulation difficulties, they're often very sensitive people, what research is now beginning to describe as super sensors. And super sensors, for those of you who have heard of the biosocial uh, model, um, they have high sensitivity, high reactivity, and a slow return to baseline with their emotions. They also have what's called double, double gravity. And that means that not only do they have to regulate in response to the stressor, they also have to regulate the extreme emotional reaction that they're having that's associated with the stressor. So this is really challenging. And so we have to help our clients kind of build the strength, give them the skills, help them develop these emotion regulation muscles in order to kind of manage not only their sensitive biology, but also the double gravity that comes with that. So this isn't all challenging though. Super sensor people, yes, are sensitive to the environment. Yes, they have high reactivity. Yes, they can be bored and impulsive. And yes, they have challenges in terms of regulating their inner states. It all, they also have incredible advantages. And a lot of research supports this, that they are highly attuned to the environment and the people around them. They're very creative. They're very curious. They have high levels of empathy and they can see patterns which means that art is an incredible way to reach these youth, help them and give them tools. So art therapy involves the use of visual artistic media within a clinical environment. And there are professionals who are trained in both mental health and creative interventions, um, who know a great way, a great deal of information about how to reach and access people to facilitate change. DBT is this transdiagnostic process-based intervention designed to help youth develop um, and everyone across the, the lifespan, uh, ways of regulating their interactions, their emotions, their interpersonal interactions. So putting these two together creates rich opportunity to create change. So what I'm going to go into next is one of the core modules of DBT, which is mindfulness. Adana spoke briefly about that in terms of it being foundational to the acceptance element of DBT. So mindfulness. It is talked about a lot. There's many descriptions for it in our current uh, you know, culture and society. Um, within a psychological context, though, it is the basic human ability to be fully present, aware of where we are and what we're doing, and to not be over, overly reactive or overwhelmed or judgmental about what is going on around us. It is a basic tenet of cognitive therapy. It's a basic tenet of acceptance-based treatments. It helps people differentiate thoughts, images, and emotions from facts. And while mindfulness is an acceptance-based skill within DBT, it is a required step for effective behavioral change. Mindfulness is so important in DBT because it is like, if we were to think of a house, it is the foundation. It is what holds us steady. It is core to actually being able to be aware of the emotions, the sensations within our body. It's core to emotion regulation, one of the modules in DBT. It is core to interpersonal effectiveness. What do I want in this interaction? How am I feeling with this person? It's core to distress tolerance, knowing that one is in a crisis situation and needs to do things differently. It is the awareness piece in behavioral change. 
So this is why mindfulness is a core skill and it has incredible benefits. It slows reactivity. This is what we're really hoping to give the youth that we work with. It reduces the risk of anxiety and depression developing. It decreases depression relapses. It improves our, our actual physiological health and our immune responses. It decreases avoidance, which is a large element um, that our youth often struggle with that often create secondary crises in their lives. It decreases anxiety, it reduces being overwhelmed, and it facilitates this really important um, element to mental health interventions in that it helps facilitate decentering, which is actually changing the relationship that we have to our thoughts and our emotions, which allows us to then do something different and not treat them as fact. So mindfulness within a DBT psychological concept is a way of living awake with our eyes wide open. This is a pretty abstract concept. And so Marsha understood that it had to be put into a behavioral skill that people could practice, something that we could actually take and do in order to increase our ability to be mindfully aware of the present moment. So she outlined three states of mind, which I'm going to speak about and then the what and the how skills. And if we can understand the heart of these skills, then you can apply it to any type of activity that you, you're going to do with your youth. And today we're gonna to be speaking specifically about art, but if you can understand that this is about increased awareness, and this is the ability to be here and now in the present moment, knowing that means that we can translate that knowledge to the youth that we work with. So the three states of mind, look at dysregulation and regulation. And so the first state of mind is this idea of reasonable mind. And this is a dysregulated state. It's cool, it's rational, it's task focused. When we're in this state, this regulation state, which is dysregulated, this is where we often are ruled by facts, logic, reason. And why it's dysregulated is that it's the absence, there's no values in it, those feelings are not taken into consideration, which means that when we act in this kind of reasonable state of mind, we often end up causing harm to people around us. We might say things that are harsh. We may not think about the impact of our words and our decisions because feelings and emotions are inaccessible when we are in that state of mind. The flip side is emotion mind. A lot of our clients spend a lot of time in emotion mind. It is also a dysregulated state. This is where our emotions are in charge. This is when we are driven by our mood, where we make decisions based on our mood and how we might be feeling. We may have urges that are impulsive and feel very pressure-based. Logic and facts are not accessible here. They don't come into the equation. So these are two very extreme versions, two very extreme states of dysregulation one that is driven purely by emotion and one that is driven purely by logic. And this is understanding these states and beginning to become aware of when we enter them because we all vacillate between these two states helps us become aware, which is a huge part of mindfulness. And it helps us become aware of how we can get to what is the third state of mind, which is wise mind. And this is the synthesis of both. This is the goal of practicing mindfulness in DBT is to get to wise mind. And wise mind is described as the inner wisdom that is in each of us. It is being able to see the value of both reason and emotion. It's the middle path. It brings everything in to, this, to the equation. It allows us to act in line with our values, our goals. We can see reason and logic to find a middle path to move forward. The other thing that's really, really fascinating about DBT and mindfulness is that there are these behavioral translations where we can do. So we understand these are my three states of mind, and now what do I actually do to get to these spots? That's where the what skills come in. So the what skills are essentially what you have to do to practice being mindful. The first one is being able to observe through our five senses and only our five senses internally and externally. This helps us stay grounded in the present, the here and now. Being able to then put our observations into words is the describe skill. This is where we describe and really try to stay in describing only what we can observe with our senses. 
And this is a very important intervention point for youth and for anyone that we might actually be working with clinically is that when we begin to accept that we can only describe what we can see with our senses, that we can't you know, observe intentions or motives of other people, that we can't actually observe their emotional states because many of us don't actually show how we're actually feeling, mm -hmm. that we can't observe sensations in other people, it helps us stop from making these assumptions and judgments about other people. It helps us stay anchored in the here and now, which helps us stay in wise mind. So being able to observe with our senses, describe only what we can see are two very powerful mindfulness-based skills. The third one is the participate skill. This is where we want that boundary between what I do and who I am to kind of melt away, to fully engage with activities, to be in the moment. Athletes describe it as flow. It's where you fully participate so completely that you experience the joy, the activation, the engagement with the world around you. So these three skills, observe, describe, participate, are what we actually do. And then there are the how skills, which is how you actually practice the what skills. They're partners. So what we wanna do here is think of being one mindful, one thing at a time. This is the how we wanna practice the other skills. So no multitasking. One being one mindful is like the opposite of doing multiple things at once. We want to be aware of judgments. We want to be able to observe and describe and participate without judgment. Can I notice judgments? Because we're all human. Judgments are going to pop into our mind. And can I become aware of them so they don't actually influence my choices and decisions? And can I do what works? Can I be effective in the moment? So the how skills always go with the what skills. Essentially, you want to observe in a one mindful, non judgmental, effective way. You want to describe things one thing at a time with non judgmental words and being able to do what works and effective for you in that moment. And can you participate in one thing at a time, which is really powerful skill for our youth to develop, to be able to slow down and not multitask? Can you engage in activities without self judgment? And can you be effective in choosing what's going to work for you in the current moment? So the what and the how skills are essentially the behaviors that we do to become mindful and get to wise mind. So how can we teach those skills? We want to remember those are the heart. Three states of mind and the observe, describe, participate, being one mindful, non-judgmental, and effective. How can we teach this through art? You can imagine there are many ways of doing it. One of the first ways is can you actually visually represent states of mind? What does it actually look like? Making it real and tangible, separate from the person, helps them begin to make sense of, wow, what do I look like when I'm in that inner wise spot? Are there particular colors, sensations, visual representations that really capture what my inner wise mind looks like? Do I know what my emotion mind looks like? Can I create a visual representation of it? My reasonable mind. And when you're able to do this and create the visual representations of the inner states, it allows you to work with it in a different way with your youth. They can, you can talk about it, you can process it, you can anchor to it in those moments when you need to access that inner wisdom. And this allows them for it to be theirs, for them to take ownership over what do my three states of mind look like? Art is an observation skill. So one way of facilitating and really exercising that observation skill, the non-judgmental way of observing um, can be practiced through looking at art, selecting particular pictures that may elicit emotional states, maybe social activism, um, topics that are incredibly important to the youth. You can select art to help clients practice their observed skill. And when you present it to them, you can ask them, what is coming up for you? What emotions do you observe? What thoughts do you observe? What sensations do you notice? This is in the moment practicing of mindfulness through art. 
art can also be a participate skill. And this really hones in on the idea that anything can be done mindfully. And the participate skill, again, remember, is about kind of dissolving that boundary between person and activity. So art is really, really about becoming one and expressing oneself through color, medium, the movement of art. And when we think about how important that is with respect to behavioral activation and reducing depression, fully participating in an activity can change the state of one's experience, can reduce anxiety. So being able to engage fully with clay, to feel it if they're doing pottery work, through dance and movement, painting, multimedia, nature and art, all of these activities facilitate, facilitate the participating the participate skill and ways of practicing it. Just think of any activity that pulls for full engagement and then be able to speak to it. If you're out working in the community with youth, maybe you're going to them. Maybe this is the only place that they feel most comfortable with. Mindful practice of internal states, the observe skill, participating, being non-judgmental can all be practiced while walking through observing street art, nature as art, being able to capture particular images if this youth maybe enjoys photography to then capture their inner experiences, to be able to talk about it, to observe and describe what comes up. One of the key components of DBT is the diary card. It's a behavioral tracking technique where we have clients track the behaviors they're wanting to change, the thoughts that they have, the emotions, the urges, and the actions. Um, it is considered a mindfulness exercise to track one's experience. It's also considered a reactive technique, meaning that by just engaging in this very um, act, we, the, you know, the behaviors that we want to change, we actually begin to change those behaviors just by becoming more aware of them. And if you remember back a few slides ago, mindfulness, awareness is the first part of behavioral change. So diary cards can be visual. They can be image-based and you want to find a way to help the client track that resonates with them. So that can be through multiple modes of media and presentation. It does not just have to be through numbers and words. And so the heart of the diary card is to actually become aware of what I do, why I do it, what emotions drive it, what thoughts drive it, and how I can do something different to act in line with my goals. So art is mindful. Like really, when you think about it and you kind of hone in on the core element here, you can observe sensations as you're engaging with art. You can describe the experience really honing in on the non-judgmental element of describing. It evokes emotions. It allows us to participate fully and also notice when we're not fully participating and the difference between those activities and what happens when we are only half in versus all in. It helps us practice non-judgmental observation of our own work and our own experience. Um, it is getting to wise mind, the art of actually Practicing art usually means we are in our wise mind when we're engaging with any type of art activity. Art can also be incredibly powerful in terms of understanding what led to certain actions. And so a DBT skill that is also a core element is chain analysis, where we actually look at naming emotions, describing emotions, the thoughts, the actions, and the situation. And this skill, this DBT skill is designed to increase regulation, to understand, to teach, to check the facts, to create learning from past experiences. If we were to put that into an art format to translate kind of that chaining element, this can be done through images. This can be done through stories, through poetry, allow the client to use any type of medium that allows them to kind of go through the process of what led to a certain behavior then you can talk about it and you can find different ways of engaging, um, different solutions the next time they may have or come across the same event or this urge. So one last note of mindfulness. As you'll notice when we go through the rest of the presentation, anything can be practiced mindfully. 
the beauty of art and skills and change and growth is that the more we are aware, the more our awareness increases, the more we're able to participate fully and deeply without judgment, being effective and skillful, the more connected ourselves and our youth become with the world. This creates space. This is the goal of mindfulness, a mindful space to make choices rather than react to the world around us. So I'm going to take us into distress tolerance now, which is another module in DBT. It is designed to help youth and clients when they are in crisis, not make the situation worse. It is designed to help us tolerate short-term or sometimes long-term pain, either physical or emotional. It is not designed for everyday use. It is not designed for solving our life's problems or building a life worth living. The other skills in DBT are very much designed for that. The interpersonal skills, the emotion regulation, the mindfulness, but crisis survival skills, distress tolerance skills, they are for when the client, the youth we work with are in a highly stressful situation that is creating this pressure that they have to act now that may then cause further problems. It is for when we're about to act on emotions or urges that are going to make things worse. And it's when clients can't make things better right away and they need to tolerate painful emotions. Distress tolerance is used when we have self-harming behaviors, suicidal urges, substance use urges, high-risk behaviors that clients are trying to change and not engage with so that they don't cause more suffering in their life. So there are a number of distress tolerance skills, and I'm going to share two of them with you that we can then translate into art. And understanding, though, kind of what the heart of distress tolerance is helps us then translate it into multiple ways of teaching. So what it is, is that engaging in activities that help to distract or reduce distress, right, so that we don't make the situation worse and allows us to accept that we are upset, upset and distressed and that we can't change the current situation. This is the heart of distress tolerance. So that means that really any form of art that helps us distract, reduce distress, or increase acceptance of the current situation is an effective distress tolerance skill. So we want to think about how to really engage adolescents because distress tolerance skills, we're asking them to act opposite to urges that maybe, you know, behaviors that they have used a lot that work really well. And we're really asking them to change in the moment of crisis, which is quite challenging. So when we're getting like youth and adolescents on board for working with us, we really have to connect why these distress tolerance skills are worth it, why it actually matters to their long-term goals. You wanna make it accessible, you wanna make it real, create these crisis plans that are actually doable and relatable to the youth. It has to be real so that they will actually connect with it and be willing to try doing it instead of other behaviors that, yep, reduce distress in the short term, but often cause a lot of difficulties later on in their life. So the first one I'm going to bring to you is Wise Mind Accepts. DBT loves acronyms and accepts is an acronym. And this skill is all about distraction. This is about distracting from what may be causing me to feel distressed or crisis urges so that I can give myself enough space and enough time to reduce the distress I'm feeling so that I do not act on problematic urges. It creates space between what is upsetting so that I can calm and regulate and come back to solving the problem to what, be my, to what might be causing distress for me. So accepts is all about different activities, doing things that take us away from what is causing distress. You must return though to solve the problem. So this is not avoidance. This is distraction in a skillful way. So the first um, letter in this acronym accepts is activities. When you think of that, any art activity can be a different activity to help distract us from what might be causing distress. C, comparisons. This is an interesting one where we teach youth about kind of comparing how they were in the past to how they are now 
maybe situations that are different from their own, but the idea is to create a cognitive comparison so that they can see the difference between the situation they're in to a different maybe situation at a later time. You can create a representation of this that might resonate deeply with youth. And when Adana gets to metaphors, you can begin to think creatively, how could I visually represent a comparison in my life? Contributions. This has a double benefit in that when we give, so when we contribute to society or people close to us or even to ourselves, um, we feel good. It also helps distract us from what might be causing us distress. Can you make art for others? Can you create a presentation that you will share? Can you give it to yourself as a gift? Can you engage in some form of creation that distracts you and allows you to give? Emotions. This is where we want to create a different emotional experience. So if you know the youth you're working with well, and maybe they struggle with anger or shame, what would be the opposite of those emotions? Would it be joy? Would it be happiness? Would it be tranquility? Can you create visual representations, movement, music that is the opposite of those emotions? And would they be willing to listen or engage with those different emotional activities to help distract from the current emotion? Pushing away is a cognitive technique. Um, and when we teach this, we often teach it as a visual imagery in the mind where you create a barrier, a boundary, like a visual box where you put what is distressing into it and you push it away. Thoughts, different thoughts, words, poetry. When you can engage in a different thought exercise, this takes you away from rumination that often upregulates distress. Sensations is also the way that we can distract through different feelings in terms of clay, mixed media, art with our fingers. This is also very grounding and regulating for youth. The other self-distress uh, tolerance skill is self-soothe. And this is often very powerful for youth who maybe feel or have and do live deprived lives. This self-soothing actually reduces vulnerability to emotion mind and it can soothe us when we are experiencing distress that goes on for long periods of time. And self-soothing is done through the five senses. So visual, tactile, sense, all forms of music can be used to soothe the system and help regulate and reduce distress. So I'm gonna take you into the flip side of distress tolerance, which are the reality acceptance skills. And these skills, are a very important part of distress tolerance because we actually have to accept that something distressing has happened. And we often need both parts, something to do to reduce my distress and accepting that I am in distress. We often teach this through five ways of solving a problem, change how we feel about it, solve the problem, accept the problem, stay miserable or make things worse. And what we're going for is beginning to accept the problem. So there's many different ways of practicing radical acceptance in terms of willingness, turning the mind, half smile, mindful breathing, and mindfulness of current thoughts. And I'm going to go over just a few and then an activity through art. So to understand willing, becoming willing to accept things, we have to understand willful, refusing to tolerate a situation, saying no, refusing to do what works, insisting that I can't is willfulness. And this will show up in therapy, in ourselves, when we're really fighting against reality. The other side of it is being willing, allowing the world to be what it is, being open, to turn our mind, to do what is needed. This gets us closer to being effective and to accept what is happening. We wanna be able to turn our mind, notice when we're not accepting, internally turn our mind and physically, almost even turn our head to begin to embrace and accept the current moment. These all help us practice reality acceptance and radical acceptance. They're abstract, and Adana is going to talk about some metaphors that can help take us through seeing radical acceptance. But first, we could do this through art as well. You can provide activities that don't have complete art um, elements to it that maybe are challenging, that maybe are diff different than what the youth is used to working with. 
And in that process of completing a task where maybe you don't have the right tools for it, or maybe um, the medium isn't what you like to use, really notice what it feels like to accept in the moment, to not accept the experience in the moment, and to work towards acceptance. So reality acceptance can be practiced, the creation of something that you actually don't like, and yet we're continuing to finish working on it. Can you accept that in the moment? So art is a great way of practicing these acceptance-based skills, which is part of distress tolerance. And with that, I'm gonna turn you over to Adana, who's gonna take us through dialectics. So having looked at mindfulness skills and distress tolerance skills, we'll now take a closer look at the concept of dialectics. So what exactly is dialectics? What role does it play in emotion regulation? How is it used within the DBT framework? And what forms of artistic and creative expression can be used to help youth be more dialectical in their thinking? So within the DBT framework, dialectics is this notion that two opposite things can both be true. And this concept is foundational to DBT. After all, it was named after, or well, the therapy is named after the concept. Um, and it is foundational because many youth who do experience mental health difficulties tend to have cognitive rigidity, right? So they tend to see things in extremes. They tend to exhibit black or white, all or nothing thinking patterns. And so dialectics helps us to identify when we might be thinking about things, reacting or behaving in extreme ways. So the aim of dialectics is to arrive at a middle path. And when we arrive at this middle path, we're able to see the kernel of truth in perspectives other than our own. And by coming to a middle path, we learn to accept and live with life's contradictions and life's uncertainties. So to do this require us to build our dialectical muscle, right? Um, because dialectics is like a muscle. The more we use it, the more we're able to then walk this middle path. So when youth begin to walk the path, um, walk the middle path, when they're able to think and act dialectically, they encounter a range of positive outcomes. They see improved relationships within the family and among their peers. Youth become more capable of listening and understanding others' perspective. They no longer are reactive to intense emotions like anger. Their ability to validate themselves and also to validate others increases. And this is really important because we know that a lot of young people that have mental health difficulties can be extremely critical of themselves. Many are unable to validate themselves because they have grown up in environments that there was a great deal of invalidation. And so dialectics allows a youth to self-validate even when the environment is not so validating of them. We also see a greater collaboration between the youth and their worker. So when a youth is able to be dialectical in their thinking, we see more openness in the working relationship between the youth, more willingness to try out new approaches and less tendency to become polarized or locked in this power struggle. So there are a few of, those are a few of the benefits um, that dialectics bring for youth, but what are the signs that we can be looking out for that might indicate when a youth is unbalanced or when their dialectical muscle is weak? So certainly if a youth is exhibiting extreme or judgmental thinking, for example, I often hear from my clients, the, the thinking of, oh, I'd rather not try than to try and fail. And many of you might have heard this from some of the youth that you work with. Now, this thinking is pretty extreme and definitely indicative of, um, of um, being unbalanced in some way. Another sign to look out for is inability, inability to validate themselves, like we mentioned, or even a youth that is continuously engaged in a power struggle a youth that dismisses others' perspectives or a youth that seems stuck on blaming others for their circumstances. These are some signs that would indicate that this youth could benefit from dialectical skills. So how can we help youth to move away from extremes and to think and act dialectically? So within a DBT framework, one dialectical skill we coach youth on is to see that there is always more than one side to anything that exists. 
and that their perspective is just one side of the matter. And a good technique to use to help you see both sides of things is to have them refrain from using the word but, instead to replace it with the word and. So to say to them, I'm gonna challenge you to go one day without using the word but. And when you have the urge to say but, replace it with and. So for example, I am friendly and I enjoy meeting people and I am reserved and shy, right? So those two things that seem opposite can both be true. But when we put the but in there, it sort of negates, it negates one over the other. Um, so the youth I worked with um, love doing this challenge and um, begin to see that when they use and in place of but, there's this shift that just naturally occurs where we begin to see and consider the validity in the opposing side. So replacing but with and also helps us to balance opposites. Um, like I said, where we're not negating one thing over the other. So I encourage all of you to try practicing right now in the chat. Um, try using the word and in place of but. Think of two opposing statements you know, that seem contradictory and use the word and rather than but. All right, so to illustrate dialectics in action, consider a blank sheet of paper, right? And a blank sheet of paper is very dialectical because it can create a dialectical connection between nothingness and everything. And um, we can kind of look at emotions with this same dialectical lens, right? Like our emotions can be a powerful mechanism to bring about positive impact in the world. And emotions can also be used in highly destructive ways. So arts offers so many possibilities to experience dialectics in action. Dialectics is an abstract term and it can be very complex for youth to wrap their head around. So the artistic process then can be a means to coach youth on dialectical skills because artistic expression in and itself is innately dialectical. So engaging in artistic expression, whether it be visual arts, uh, creative movement, writing, acting, provides youth with opportunities to experience the contradictory truths of dialectics. And some of these contradictory truths can look like the following statements. I am dissatisfied with what I have created and I can accept what I have created and try again. I am building my skills through my art and I am still learning and will make mistakes along the way. So the dialectical nature of artistic expression can be especially helpful for youth who struggle with perfectionism and might hold back from engaging in arts because of unrealistic standards, right? And an, an example of this is one youth that I worked with um, who really, really enjoyed writing um, when she was a child and has been suffering from debilitating writer's block. And so every time she would attempt to write something creative, she would get frustrated and just abandon writing altogether. So one way we got around this was getting her into the practice of stream of consciousness writing some of you might have um, might be familiar with this technique already, but she would just write whatever thoughts popped into her head. And through this process, she was able to embrace the dialectics of I have writer's block and I can still put pen to paper and write words that come to mind. And so through, through this dialectic, she was able to see that she can still express herself through words, despite this block that she felt she had. So some ways we can help our youth embrace dialectics and everyday art. We can encourage them to be open to change, challenge your youth to try new forms of artistic expression. If they are having a writer's block, then can they try a different artistic form? Can they try painting or can they try dance movement? Um, or can they turn their writer's block into an embodied character? Can they give it a name? That in itself is artistic expression. Right? So having them be open to, to change in some way is dialectical. We want to also help our youth to understand that change is transactional and so is art. If you mix two colors of paints together, you're going to create a new color, 
right? So when youth express themselves through artistic means, they create something new. And through engaging in the creative process, some aspects of themselves change as well. A key part of dialectics is the notion that we are all connected. And art can be such a profound way for youth to experience this. So one idea for an activity is to have groups of youth work together to create an artistic piece. Um, have them notice how we are all connected, not only in the air we breathe, but in how we create art together. Uh, this activity can be highly validating because you get a situation where youth then validate others um, pieces of artwork. Okay, so we're going to shift gears a bit to explore one creative means to help youth with dialectical skills, and that's through metaphors and storytelling. So here we'll look at how metaphors is used within a DBT framework and the incredibly powerful role that metaphors and storytelling can play in helping youth to be dialectical and make sense of their emotions. So some of you might be familiar with the story um, right here on the slide about the two wolves. For those of you who are not familiar, the story goes like this. One evening, an old Cherokee told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, the battle is between the two wolves inside all of us. One is evil, it is angry, envy, jealousy, sorrow, guilt, greed. The other is good, it is joy, peace, love, hope. The grandson thought about this for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf wins? And his grandfather simply said, the one you feed. So this piece of storytelling, I think, illustrates how metaphors and metaphorical storytelling can be an expressive form of communication. It goes without saying that metaphors are so ingrained in our everyday language, right? That we often don't even notice or pay attention to when we're using them. Some research have actually found that on average, people use a metaphor every 20 seconds, every 20 seconds. So that's just goes to show how pervasive metaphors is um, in the way we communicate. And in many cultures, metaphorical storytelling is used to communicate values, moral standards. Um, in my own culture, uh, where I'm from, parents often turn to metaphorical storytelling and allegories to instill a children, um, to instill a lesson to a child. Uh, one popular metaphor that I often heard as a child was the metaphor of a child that washes their hand really well can sit and eat with kink. And really the whole point of the metaphor was to teach like obedience, right? And to instill the message of um, a child um, listening to their elders and being obedient. Um, so I'm curious to hear what other metaphorical stories or phrases were told to you all as a child um, to communicate values or morals. Uh, if any comes to mind, put them in the chat. We would love to hear them. Now, in DBT, metaphors are used to teach dialectical thinking because they help ideas be more memorable. And many brain imaging studies have actually found that when we hear a metaphor, um, regions of the brain associated with tactile experiences actually become activated. So which might explain why metaphors and stories can be profoundly visceral. Because metaphors and stories provide a verbal, a, a rich verbal context that evokes strong visceral responses in us, it actually allows for abstract concepts to be made more concrete. And using metaphors also helps to bypass resistance that a youth might be having when talking about highly sensitive matters. So we also use metaphors in DBT to help clients to gain a deeper understanding of their emotions. We use metaphors to help them illustrate unhelpful behaviors, unhelpful thought patterns that they might be displaying. So essentially, the effect of metaphors is like holding up a mirror to someone's face. When you hold up a mirror, we can then communicate a therapeutic message that can provide a pathway to facilitate some change. OK, so here are a few examples of metaphors I've used in the past. Um, some uh, Carmen, I believe, has used as well. Um, and one that I particularly like is, is the first one. You not trying 
because you're afraid of rejection is like turning off a movie before you're afraid because you're afraid of how it's going to end. Yeah, you won't have to deal with the fear or you're now going to be left with agonizing emotions about what happens in the end. And then another one is repressing anger is like stuffing trash into a garbage can. Eventually, it's going to spill over if you don't take the trash out. And then there's one of it's like going to the gym. You might not see instant results, but over time, you begin to reap the benefits. So those a few collection of um, uh, useful metaphors. And here's a pretty cool metaphor to illustrate the goal of mindfulness that Harmon talked about earlier. So a house is like your mind. The ground floor is where you perceive your senses, where you are most grounded. The second floor is where you categorize. So you say, oh, that's a chair, that's a cat, that's a couch. The third floor is where we begin to categorize if something is wanted, unwanted, safe, unsafe, good or bad. So we can see this as the evaluation floor. The fourth floor, the attic, is where we attribute meaning, assumptions, and worries. And then we think about things over and over again. So this is where judgments live and where assumptions and worries grow in the heat of the attic. So the goal of mindfulness then is to learn what floor we are on and how to become grounded and walk the stairs back to, um, back to the ground floor. So the metaphor shows how the aim of mindfulness is really um, to, to become grounded and to know, to be aware of the different levels of the house that we're on. One activity to do with your youth is to have them create a visual representation of this metaphor um, and have them be able to ground themselves and learn to identify judgments and learn to dissenter and change their relationships to their thoughts. So um, a few suggestions of ways to use metaphors and stories with youth. The more provocative the metaphor, the more impactful, right? So employing stories and metaphors with a strong visual imagery will help the message land more. And also metaphors do not necessarily have to be verbally or orally delivered. I find that internet meme culture, which is so popular among young people these days, actually serve the same effect as metaphors or metaphorical stories. So here's um, an internet, uh, a meme that I pulled up from the internet. I don't procrastinate. I wait until the last minute to do things because I will be older and therefore wiser. Uh, so internet memes for sure is a good way of delivering a therapeutic message to a youth and it adds a bit of humor to it too. And just the last tip on this, uh, the creation of a metaphor in itself can be a powerful artistic tool. And, and one activity to do with your youth could be to ask them to think about a particular situation um, or a particular struggle or an emotion, even a dilemma in their life, and to have them come up with a metaphor that somehow describes its essence. So, um, for example, maybe the habit of avoiding things that bring up feelings of fear. What metaphors can a youth create to illustrate this? All right. Um, so metaphors, particularly those that invoke imagery, can also help youth to radically accept what they can't change. Now, Carmen spoke earlier about the concept of radical acceptance. And the metaphor of quicksand, uh, of quicksand is a good analogy to use to explain radical acceptance to young people. So when you're in quicksand, struggling isn't going to help you get out, right? And so that kind of um, illustrates the aim of radical acceptance is to um, accept things that we can change to help us to re reduce our suffering. So having your youth or groups of youth create an artistic representation of what radically acceptance looks like to them um, is a good way of really honing in the message to them. Um, can they create a visual representation of what willfulness is or what willingness is? All right, so in DBT, emotion regulation skills um, and to to cover this very quickly, our cluster of skills to change ineffective emotional behaviors. And Carmen will speak to this a bit later. 
Um, but there are a variety of emotion regulation skills that is beyond the scope of this webinar to cover. Um, but I would still like to highlight two emotion regulation skills and how metaphors can be used to illustrate these skills to youth. So one skill we call it, um, well, we don't call it, DBT calls it, checking the facts. The aim with this skill is to help an individual understand that their emotions are often reactions to thoughts and interpretations of an event. Rather than, rather than to the actual fact of an event. So by checking the fact, an individual is able to appraise whether the emotion they might be feeling as a result of um, an external stimuli is in proportion to the fact of the event. So um, to kind of use a metaphor to illustrate this, if you think about a house of mirrors, the reflection we see in a house of mirrors can change, right? Depending on what mirror we're looking at. Some mirrors can elongate us, some can um, shorten us, and really our reflection is going to change depending on the surface. So our emotions too can affect what we see and think and how we react. The second emotion regulation skill is called PLEASE skill. And this is an acronym. There is an acronym for everything in DBT. And the whole aim of the acronym is to get an individual to focus on balancing uh, things like nutrition, eating, sleep, exercise. And then in addition to the PLEASE skill, we have built in mastery, which is engaging in activities that build a sense of self-efficacy and accomplishments. So these two skills, PLEASE skills and build in mastery can be akin to the idea of filling your bucket. So you can fill your bucket with activities that promote well-being. And then there are those things that put holes in your bucket, like insufficient sleep, physical illnesses, mood alter altering substances, or not being engaged in school, not being not um, being employed. Some people here might be familiar with the term NEET and E E T, so that stands for youth that are not currently engaged in educational training, and how these youth tend to have lower mental health outcomes. So these two metaphors. Um, well, this metaphor of um, filling your bucket kind of transmit the idea that um, in order for us to be well, in order for us to be able to, to live fulfilling lives and to thrive, we need to be able to prioritize things that allow us um, to increase our emotional resiliency and to decrease our vulnerability to intense emotions. And so these are some examples of metaphors that we can use to transmit the messages behind these two emotion regulation skills. So I'll pass it back to Carmen um, to talk more about emotion regulation through arts. So we wanted to add in um, just like two more slides on kind of emotion regulation, um, as Adana mentioned, um, covering the reg emotion regulation module within this webinar, we did not have time for. And we still wanted to leave you with a few key thoughts around how art can be an amazing medium to understand how to regulate one's emotions. And so emotion regulation, as I've kind of alluded to, and as we've alluded to throughout this presentation, is our ability to really be aware of, listen to, accept what our emotions give to us to increase happiness and joy. And the heart of the emotion regulation module is actually building a life worth living. It's how can I engage every day with my emotions in activities and tasks that actually make me wanna wake up in the morning to sustain long-term happiness, mastery building and value work. And so art is an amazing way of doing this. Art in and of itself is like a mastery building skill. It is a mastery building skill. And mastery building is a powerful skill in the emotion regulation module in DBT. And it's in DBT because we know that when youth and individuals are able to engage in mastery building activities, over time, not only does it improve their move, it's, it's a powerful part of behavioral activation. It also facilitates confidence, self-esteem, and over time, it helps one look back and see what they are able to do. That's a very powerful experience for youth who often are met with situations and environments and circumstances where they feel very stuck and change feels very difficult. So mastery building is an emotion regulation skill. And in art, just by engaging in art, you can see 
mastery building unfold by choosing a, partic a particular um, project or a particular medium that they want to work with. And over time, every day, continuing to engage in that medium of art allows mastery building to occur. It also, when they're working in that art and working through that art, probably aligns with their values. And when we are aligning and acting with our values, we are in our wise mind. So it's a powerful medium for which to learn regulation of emotions, our mindfulness skills, metaphor use, and what it feels like to build mastery. It also helps us become aware of our internal states. Art in and of itself allows us to show what is on the inside and sometimes very hard to communicate. So by engaging in all forms of medium of art, music, dance, clay, poetry, writing, we can begin to help create a way of communicating and understanding and conveying our emotions. We can, uh, this can facilitate youth in understanding what emotions are allowed in their life, what emotions were allowed growing up. There's many activities where you can draw a circle and have the youth kind of draw and speak to the emotions that they feel comfortable with they're on the inside and the emotions that they don't feel comfortable with, they're on the outside. And you can do this through visual representations. So art is a powerful medium for translating how to learn to understand, accept, befriend, learn about our emotions. So DBT and art therapy, just to begin summarizing, summarizing up here, it facilitates mindfulness, which is a foundational skill in DBT. Art is highly suited to non-traditional learners, super sensors, neurodivergent individuals. Art facilitates the use of metaphors, which is a key teaching tool in DBT around understanding very abstract and difficult concepts. Art therapy also highlights, and just by engaging in art, the non-judgmental nature that DBT hopes to instill and facilitate and grow within the youth and the clients we work with. It allows the clinician and the youth to enter a paradox where dialectical strategies can be discussed, experienced, and worked through. It also allows clinicians to really connect with some very didactic and probably like very um, academic type skills into translating them to lived experiences, tactile and hands-on experiential exercises that actually is easier for youth to relate to. So to summarize, DBT has been adapted to be used across the lifespan. It's transdiagnostic, it's been adopted to use for multiple populations, and a lot of work is being done to ensure that it is conveyed and um, given and worked with communities with cultural humility. It's more experiential, which makes it more generalizable to the youth we work with. Art is an exceptional way to teach DBT skills. And if we can know kind of the heart and the soul of each of these skills, that will then allow us to engage in this highly um, kind of diverse and process-based intervention. If you know the principles of DBT, you can usually apply them to in very creative ways. DBT is about creating a life worth living, and art also can be about creating a life worth living. And the more real therapy can be with youth, the greater chance we have of reaching the youth we work with and helping them. And art and DBT are two very powerful ways of creating and connecting with youth that allow for the real, genuine, authentic, and culturally humble connections that we seek to build with the youth we work with. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here, for joining. Um, we look forward to answering your questions. If we can't get to them today, you are free to email both myself or Adana, and we are be happy to respond to your questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Youth Rex.